Hello everyone and welcome to the Geek Nighter podcast. I am your host Kevali Akte and I am back with another very interesting episode. Today we have Alina with us and we are going to talk about Graal VM. If you are in the Java space, you have probably heard about Graal VM. And if you are pretty active in tech community, you might have also heard uh, the recent challenge that was created 1BRC by Bruno Morling. And Graal VM really shined in that particular challenge. And that's how I actually became curious and I reached out to Alina about creating this episode and we can talk more about Graal VM, its features and how does it do that. So welcome Alina and I'm really excited to have you with me and to talk about Graal VM and to learn from you. So thanks a lot for joining and let's start a little bit about yourself, like introduction and how you landed up working with Graal VM. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. So yeah, hi everyone. My name is Helena. I'm a developer advocate for Graal VM at Oracle. And more specifically, I work at Oracle Labs. And Oracle Labs is this R&D unit at Oracle where we are developing all the new cool stuff. And Graal VM has actually been one of our research projects for a while. I think we recently checked the numbers and we started working on it in 2011. So I guess we've been working on it for the past 13 years. And I could talk about it some more, but I guess I skipped the intro. So yeah, I'm a developer advocate. So I'm doing all things developer relations. So I'm speaking at conferences about Graal VM, creating blog posts, creating demos, basically doing anything I can to get developers excited about Graal VM and get them to use Graal VM and then making sure that while they use it, it's relevant for them, useful for them and see how else we can improve it for people. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. I mentioned one BRC challenge because I was following that challenge and the people who were actually putting up their solutions and competing to make it faster and faster. And that's when I saw that the few of the top solutions were using Graal VM, right? And we'll get to some of the details like how native image compilation works and just-in-time compilation works. And But I'm curious to understand what is the historical context here and what problem did it aim to solve? Yep. Thanks for that. I was not around at the time, but like from talking to the team and from reading the papers that I published in the process. So the team wanted to create a new compiler for Java. And they had this interesting vision that they can write that compiler itself in Java. And at the time, it seemed maybe a bit revolutionary and unusual because even now you would think that you would write things like that has to be like, have to be low level, close to the operating system in things like C, C++. But the team had this vision that they can create this compiler in Java itself. And this way it can be probably more easy to maintain, extend, add new optimizations. You get to work in Java yourself, right? So we actively ourselves using Java on the team. So that was one big mission that we had on the team. Let's see if we can do this. And also they had this vision that they wanted to create a universal VM that can run all the multiple different applications fast. And I think I saw this like sentence somewhere in the presentations that they did in early days, uh, that they had this vision that every language deserves to have a high performance implementation. So Graal VM is like highly known as a JDK, as an AT image, but also they had this vision that they can create an easy way for people to develop new language implementations because the way this works in the industry is that it takes quite a bit of effort and a very qualified team if you want to create a language implementation, because indeed it is a lot of work, right? And it's not always that all the languages are backed up by such big teams or teams that can dedicate enough time to make it happen. Some of the team was also thinking maybe we can offer a way to build language implementations easier. And this is how Truffle came to be, our language implementation framework that I think we will talk about in a detail later on. But there are ways to add new languages to Graal VM fairly easily. And there are a bunch of language implementations on top of Graal VM, uh, not just Java, but also things like Java, JavaScript, etc. So we will get to that. But at the moment where we see the most excitement in the community is around Graal VM as a JDK and native image this ahead of time compilation that was also such a popular solution in the one billion rows challenge that you mentioned. Yeah, that, that makes sense. If I have to talk about a very high level, some of the features, so you, mm-hmm. you mentioned native image compilation and there are some other features. So as a developer, if I have to look for a new JDK and I come across Graal VM, 
What are some of the high-level features that are really exciting? Uh, yeah, so talking about GraalVM, first thing that you probably notice is that it's also a JDK. And the thing is that many people love us for native image and I suddenly understand and share that excitement. But also GraalVM is a JDK with a very good JIT compiler. So that JIT compiler that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, really itself is Java. In Java, it's very good. And in fact, there are many teams who are using GraalVM just a JDK because it's totally easy. So you just download GraalVM or maybe install with SDKMN. You swap your Java home for GraalVM and then you get the exact same JDK, but with a different compiler. And many applications will see performance benefits just from that. So that will be maybe, it's hard to give a generic number, but maybe it can be like 10, 15%, 20% performance improvement. But for those like large scale application that adds up and can end up in a significant performance improvement. That is one part of it. And what's interesting, I think I saw a talk of one of the people who worked on the original C2 compiler in the hotspot. And they said that if they were writing a new compiler in or like around the time that they were working on GraalVM, they also would have done it in Java because it makes sense. And it shows that Java can be also used to this like low level operating system kind of stuff to actually run applications, right? So that is GraalVM as a JDK. And then there's also native image ahead of time compilation, which is another big part of the story where we are taking your application, compiling it ahead of time. And in the end, you have a platform-specific native executable. But the benefit is that we are shifting all of that work of loading classes, analyzing, optimizing, compiling from runtime to build time. So what we are doing is we're moving all that work to the build time. And then when you're starting your application, none of that needs to happen. It doesn't even need a JVM to run. It's just a native application in the end. So that is native image. And there's also this like truffle and polyglot and run non-Java languages on the GraalVM part where you can run JavaScript, you can run Python, you can run Ruby, you can even mix and match them or embed them in Java applications. There are so many opportunities. That's why it's a bit complicated maybe to talk about GraalVM sometimes because different people can mean different things. But as an overview, that is it. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. And especially when people talk about, oh, Java is an old programming language and it's slow and there's so many talks. So things like this makes it more exciting, right? Like I can write my Java code and compile it in native image. And that gives me this like same performance as I would write in some other low level language. So it's pretty, pretty cool. What are the typical audience mm -hmm. when we talk about VM, right? So what are the typical use cases that people end up using GraalVM for? Sure. So there are so many things that you can do with it. So as a JDK, it will be basically any place where you can use Java or use JDK. You can just as much use GraalVM. So, you know, so many opportunities there. If you're talking about native image specifically, I would argue that you can use native image in the exact same scenarios as well. But where we see, I would say, the most excitement in the community is in situations where startup or resources usage matters. So those will be things like microservices, serverless, deploying applications to the cloud, maybe CLI apps, even like larger scale applications still make sense because if you care about resources usage, so maybe you want to use less CPU, less memory, even for a larger application that can still be a reason to go with native image. So I would say in situations where startup or resources usage matters, native image will be your best choice, definitely. Yeah, so this brings me to a question. When you say that your startup time and resource usage matters, I believe it always matters, right? Like when do we distinguish that it matters mm -hmm. enough that you have to look for a new solution versus it's okay to have a little bit longer startup time? So what are some of the real world use cases where people felt that, oh, you know what? We really need to look for something like RALVM. So are there some case studies or success stories that you could share? People use RALVM and they really benefited from its features. Sure. So for startup time, like that's probably the first thing that people notice about native image. And that's why when they ask me questions about native image, they sometimes say, okay, native image is cool for startup. We all get it. We all have seen it. Like your screen boot or your mock application can start is something like 30, 40 milliseconds. That's all great. But let's say I have a more like long running application that I just deploy and it runs, let's say, for days or even weeks. 
And in that case, maybe I don't care about startup that much. And it's a fair point. I get it. Like startup is important, especially let's say for serverless applications, but it's not always the case. And, but that's not also not the only thing that native image is like good at or can help you with, right? So startup is good because we no longer already compile application, no longer better at runtime. And that's actually an interesting point because sometimes when you look at native image and compilation, if you're compiling a larger application like enterprise scale, sometimes people will tell me it takes a while to compile and I don't understand why I need to be spending that much time. But the thing is, it does not really introduce any additional overhead compared to running on the JVM. It's just that the JVM will do the same thing at runtime as you are running your application. So it will maybe more evenly spread that effort around the whole runtime, but you will still need to do all of that work around understanding what the application does and actually compiling it. And you will need to do it every time when it starts while we give you this kind of trade-off where you get to do all that work at the build time, where you can maybe dedicate the time and resources to make it happen. But then you probably start your application way more often than you build it. So it makes sense to shift that work to build time and then get to start it way more often. But that is still a startup. And as I said, that's not the only benefit. And another interesting benefit is resources usage and especially around memory, because typically memory is the most expensive kind of resource in the cloud. So CPU typically is not that expensive, but memory is expensive, right? And native image is uses a significantly less memory than applications running on the JVM because, again, we don't need to do any of that work around compiling code and runtime, right? And uh, there is that. And there is another interesting benefit of native image that I don't, I don't think is talked about enough, and that is security. And that like adds an additional security layer on top of JVM, right? So we are not exactly replacing things, but we are just extending the platform and adding more things. And this is coming from the fact that we are compiling things ahead of time. And also some things in native image are done differently than on the JVM. So if you want to do reflection, for example, that requires some of the reflection stuff native image will do by itself out of the box. But some of those things will require an additional allow list from your end. And that might be seen as a limitation, but I would say just a different choice and a different maybe paradigm. And this way you also have a bit more control and awareness of what is happening in your application, because unless you specifically allow those things, or maybe your framework library, et cetera, will configure those things, it will not happen, right? And that eliminates a good amount of possible attack vectors. And another kind of safety dimension, security dimension is that there is no just-in-time compilation anymore at runtime, so you cannot attack the application from the JIT side. And then the last but not least, I haven't talked about it when we were talking about the benefits, but also native image eliminates all the code that you are not using. So when you're building an application, it will look at it and then it will throw away everything you're not using. So it can produce this fairly small native executable in the end. So those are like just some of the benefits of using native image along with like smaller packaging size. So you can deploy applications easily, scale them more easily, et cetera. And he also asked me about some of the use cases. So there are so many, but I probably will highlight a few of them. So GraalVM itself went J. I checked this morning in 2019. This time flies, so it's hard to get track, to track of those things. But yeah, in 2019, and I think as early as 2020, Alibaba were already using GraalVM and more specifically native image in production. And I'm very proud of this because it's been like four years. And at that time, native image was still pretty revolutionary and new. Like it was GA, like people were hesitant because it was something new, something un like unusual. So I can understand that hesitation, but it was very cool because they deployed the applications both with native image in production and not just in production, but during one of their like big sales festival. So under a huge load of people like going online and going to Alibaba's websites. And they were very happy. And the reason why they went was for all VM is because they wanted to improve startup times, but also reduce resources usage. And just like for understanding of the scale, I think they shared numbers and the original application running on the JVM. They have big apps because Alibaba. But I think it started in something like a minute. So it took a minute for the application to start. And then with native image, it went down to three seconds which is still maybe not so fast for the application to start and become available. But at that scale, one minute versus three seconds, that explains the difference. And they also did measurements in terms of memory, and they were very happy with the results. So I'm happy that they have been using GraalVM for that long. And talking about some more recent stories, I would say, 
There is one from NetSuite. That is one of the teams here at Oracle. And they moved to Grow VM as a JDK because, again, that's a huge scale. And those performance benefits that they get even from the compiler itself, for them, that uh, they have huge applications deployed or probably thousands of servers like around the world. And for them, at that scale, the compiler gave significant performance benefits that they did the measurements and they moved to Grow VM. They're very happy with that. We have a blog post about it on Medium. And one more cool story that will be, again, native image. So that is coming from the Disney streaming team. And they were deploying their applications on serverless. And that was, I think, um, the messaging team or something. So the team that is responsible for sending notifications, emails, et cetera, to users. And obviously, there are like millions and millions of those going on on Disney. So they were looking for a way to reduce, again, startup times of their applications on serverless, on Lambda. And first, they approached this by giving more memory to the app which seems like a reasonable thing to do. And they did reduce the startup time to something. I think it was like three seconds as well in the end, but they were still not very happy with the startup times. So they gave a try to native image. I think they paired it with Micronaut as a framework. And then the startup times went to like maybe 300 milliseconds, like significantly faster. And they also emphasized those other benefits such as using less memory, et cetera. Yeah, many user stories, but those might be my favorite. Pretty cool. Um, and those are like significant improvements talking about those kind of scales. Uh, it's, it's really important for these apps. Uh, let's go a little bit deeper and understand the, mm -hmm. the technicalities. Like when, when we say native image compilation, if I have to assume I'm a beginner, I don't know, I'm new to Java, for example, or I'm new to programming for that matter. Explain me the process, like what happens. So I'm writing my little Java program and I want to use Graal VM. What is the process like? How does the native image compilation happen? And what is the end product that I get? I like how you phrase it. Maybe you're even new to programming. So that's an add, additional level of complexity to the question. But yeah, I think I got it. So normally you would run your application, the JVM, right? So you have to have a JVM running that understands your app, understands bytecode, and can run the application, right? With probably, and you would run it in the way that like you type Java and you give it your application and it runs on the JVM, right? With IT image, it's a bit different. So first you need to build your application as a native executable. So the way this works is there is this native image utility inside GraalVM, and as an input, is it's using bytecode. So you can give it your jar, or you can give it your class file. That's the kind of format it understands. And then when you run the command, it will start the building process, and it will also show you like your very useful, nice output explaining each step of the way what is happening. And what it will do, it will look at your application, and it will first will try to understand what exactly your application is supposed to do. And what is actually that code that it's using from what you wrote, from the JDK itself, from all of your dependencies. So it will first try to analyze what the application does, and it will look at the main method and then what it's being called from main. And it will start looking all the ways to understand what the, all the possible code paths that can be executed to understand what the application does. So it will only include that code that you are using in that native executable. That's one part of the story. So like understanding what application does, performing the analysis. And another interesting part is that as you're building your application with native image, we will also perform heap snapshotting. So we will see which object or objects your application is supposed to allocate, and then we will take a snapshot of it. So you can start with this pre-populated heap more fast, like startup will be better. And we will perform those two operations in iterations until we understand, okay, we know everything about your application. We know everything there is to know. And one more important note here that this is happening on the closed world. So this is happening ahead of time. The runtime hasn't happened yet. So that's, I think, a big difference with run application on the JVM, right? So we need to understand everything there is to understand about the application as we are still building it ahead of time. And as we have built it, we will produce a native executable version of your app that is also platform specific. So because we depend on some specific JDK classes that are different for different platforms, we will produce a native executable version per platform. So let's say I'm a, a Linux user, my output will be a Linux executable that I can run on a Linux machine. And then for MacBook, Windows, et cetera, I would need to build on 
those platforms. But then again, there are come to rescue CI CD systems, such as even GitHub Actions works like a charm with 12 VM, and we see a lot of traction there and a lot of usage there. So in the end, what you have is an native executable that you can run on that platform and that starts very fast and does exactly what your application is supposed to do. All enough, it's a native executable and no longer a like, traditional run on the JVM as you might have been used to. Interesting. This makes sense. And I want to ask, so since we are doing a lot of things, let's say decision making at the build time instead of runtime that the JVM does for us, uh, there might be some things that are not necessarily known. And I think you mentioned this briefly while you were explaining some of the limitation that you might have to have some kind of allow list. So taking an example, since I'm a bit familiar with Spring and it's not other frameworks, what happens when I have some configuration that is only resolved at the runtime? For example, some conditional bean creation or something like that. How does that get resolved at the build time? I'm so glad you asked about Spring because that's one of my favorite topics, like Spring and how Spring came to work with Brawl VM even in the first place. And the thing is, but this is, wasn't that hard, but was challenging in a way is because the way Spring works as a framework is at runtime, it will look at your application and all the different ways how you can provide configuration for the Spring framework and pulling all that config together, it will try to understand what your application is supposed to do and re resolve all of that at runtime. And Nati image will try to do the same thing, but at build time. And it's interesting how those two worlds came together and like how they work together because Spring wants to do everything at runtime or it used to work this way at runtime. Yeah. And Nati image is trying to do the same thing, but at build time where runtime hasn't happened yet. So the way this works is that quite a while ago, maybe four years ago or three years ago, the Spring team started working on a project that's called Spring Native. And that was an effort to incubate and develop integration between the Spring framework and Grawl VM. And now this is integrated into mainline Spring since I think 2022. So now this works with your like normal Spring apps available at start of Spring.io, et cetera. And the way this works is there is this now Spring IoT engine in the Spring framework itself. And this works in a way that they did work on the Spring framework side of things, but also this Spring IoT engine will transform your application in a way that is friendly towards native image, that native image can more easily understand and resolve. And but it will also produce configuration files that might be needed for native image, for things like reflections, realization, proxies, et cetera. And yeah, so that, that, and that was third bullet that I had in mind and I forgot, oh, it will also give you an API. So if there is some custom code that you wrote and maybe it does reflection, et cetera, you can also manually specify that, hey, please register this for reflection for me. Normally this will be done by the Spring framework, by the libraries, et cetera, but maybe there is some custom code uh, that you wrote and you want to make it native image friendly and it's not at the moment. So Spring will give you an API against which you can, let's say, put in a notation, register for reflection, et cetera, and they will produce this config files for you. So at the moment we have a very nice integration and that, that was a bit like maybe more deep dive as a normal user needs to know. But as a normal user, what you need to know is you just go to start Spring.io, you create your project, you add dependencies, and the very first thing I think even that you see on the list is raw VM and native image. So it's fairly easy to build a new project with Spring and Call VM in 2024. Cool. So it's pretty interesting to know that major frameworks like Spring are actually supporting and able to work together with Graal VM. What are some of the other frameworks that are supporting Graal VM in, in that way? Yeah, so it's definitely Spring. There is also Micronaut, there is Corcus, there is Halidon. And in fact, there are so many frameworks and libraries that work with Graal VM these days. Then in fact, they even have this page on the Graalvm org website. And that's also a very useful one. If you want to know, let's say I'm starting a new project and I want to maybe quickly evaluate my dependencies and see which of that works definitely smoothly out of the box with Graalvm. So if you just Google ready for Graalvm or ready for native image, you will end up on our website. And there is a super long list of libraries that are known to be working and constantly testing with native image. 
Now that list might, might not be complete. Probably there is more out there, but this is maintained by the community. And that's something that people actually reported to us that, hey, this library is working and testing with RollVM. Yeah, that's a very good place to find those libraries and frameworks that work with RollVM. And there might be more out there, but that's, let's say, a minimal list that is proven to be working for sure. Very cool. I'm a bit curious to understand, you know, let's say I'm using RollVM and if I in the traditional way of doing it, let's say I don't use Kral VM. I have a Spring application and I write some tests and have some profiles and I create some beans. And at the runtime, I figure out, oh, this bean has some problem. Let's say there's no bean defined like that. And my test fails. So since now I, I use Kral VM and that is being done at the build time, how does the testing of things change? Is it also impacting the testing? Yeah, that's an interesting point. So in general, there's support for testing from the frameworks. Usually each of them offers some kind of testing. Mm. I'm like jumping the topic a bit now, but for example, for like more advanced testing, for integration testing, usually frameworks offer you some kind of feature that is built maybe let's say on test containers. So for example, in Quarkus, that will be called Quarkus Dev Services. In Micronode, that's Micronode Test Resources. So even for integration testing, you have support for GraalVM specifically. But then to talk about testing in general, again, frameworks support this. Also, we have this project from the GraalVM team called the Native Build Tools, and that is our Maven and Gradle plugin. So even if you are not using any of those frameworks that are working with GraalVM, you can add our Native Build Tools. And that will also give you support for testing, more specifically JUnit testing as well. That all works. But also in general, our recommendation is that if you're building applications with RollVM and native image, we recommend that you keep developing your application and testing your application, et cetera, on the JVM. And then you compile to native, let's say, as a part of your CI CD or like once in a while. But this is not something that you need to constantly compile, let's say every, I don't know, half an hour, especially if you're changing things around your business logic. And if you're not touching things that might be sensitive towards native image, such as reflection, serialization, et cetera, you just keep developing application on the JVM and then you compile to native as a more or less last step in your deployment process or in CI CD. Or maybe if you're introducing a new dependency and you want to make sure it works well with all VM, but as a rule of thumb, you just keep developing on the JVM and you rely on the frameworks and libraries and tooling to also make sure things will work in the native space. That, that, that actually makes it easier for a developer, right? Because they don't have to change the way they think, right? And they can still program their application, focus on the business logic and write application as if they are going to use JVM, for example, but then rely on these frameworks and libraries to make sure that it all works and it is properly tested because there, there is support within the framework as well. So that is pretty cool. Just um, one more note there. So like you, you said that like we're trying to make things work in the way developers usually work. And that's actually the way we make many of the decisions when we develop RollVM. So if you ever like notice and pay attention, most of the flags that you're using on the JVM, on the way you run your application on the JVM, our idea is if you just replace the Java command with the native image command, all the same flags, command, et cetera, should work. So in the end, our goal is like you have the same developer experience on the JVM, only you have your native image command, but it should be taking the same flags and work in the same way as you expect the JVM because you want to give you as close experience to the JVM as possible. So this is actually something we always keep in mind in terms of developer experience. And that's our end goal that in the end you have as similar experience to the JVM as possible. That is pretty cool. And that brings me to the next question where I, I believe since Java is such a mature technology and there are so many amazing projects built in Java, most of the folks that want to move to something like RALVM it's going to be like they are going to have some kind of migration. Of course, there is new development happening, but majority of the cases I think would be like migrating from the regular JVM based applications to Kral VM JDK. So how does that migration happen? Is it just about just replace the JDK and then it all works? Or what are the considerations or some things that I should keep in mind as a developer who wants to migrate to GraalVM. So I would say it largely depends on what your application is doing exactly, which dependencies it's using, et cetera. 
as a rule of thumb, I would probably start with evaluating your dependencies. And then if you're using one of the frameworks that we mentioned before, or in general, any framework, I would see if I can migrate to a version of that framework that is working with raw VM. That will be the easiest task. Like you can yeah. do it on the older version of the framework library, et cetera, but moving to a newer version, if possible, would definitely be a good shot. Like for example, for Spring Boot, they introduced native image as GA supported in 3.0. So for Spring Boot, if you can move to 3.0 or higher, that would be a very good way moving forward. Now, if that is not possible, or maybe you are using your own, I don't know, custom internal framework or just like no framework at all, I would start by adding, again, native build tools. So I will maybe and greater plugin, and that will help you with testing, with packaging application, and also for known libraries, it will simplify configuration a lot for you. Because talking about libraries, there is this effort, ideally a library to be friendly towards native image. It might be friendly out of the box, but then if it's not, the best way to make the library work with native image is to provide configuration files. And those are just JSON files saying, hey, if I'm going to be doing reflection, this is exactly where I want to be doing that. So please make it, as you're building application, please build an application and part of that and include that call in the app. So ideally, that config can be shared by the library, but then if not, we have this centralized place on GitHub called Call VM Metadata Reachability Repository. And that is like a centralized place where maintainers, users, etc., can contribute, share, and then reuse config files for non-libraries because we thought that, okay, maybe at some point, some of us or some of our users have figured out config for library X. And then why new users need to be figuring out the same thing. If we can just put it on GitHub and then we can develop tooling to automatically pull that config from that centralized place. And the way I'm bringing this up because I have a Maven and Gradle plugins now by default pull this config. So let's say I have an app that is using, I don't know, some database and that database has not yet added support for GraalVM, but that is in this reachability repo. So if I have native Maven and Gradle plugins, they will go over, they will pull that config for me. So my experience is that things just work and I don't need to be concerned by any of that. And talking about migration and like things you need to know about, I also want to mention performance because I work on a compiler and that's a very important topic for us. We come from the Java space and in the Java space, we are very used to the JVM and how good it is at optimizing for big performance. And JVM is a really impressive piece of engineering and it's very hard to beat it or even get on par with the JVM in terms of big performance. But we have this big ambitious goal for native image that we can make it happen. And yeah, the way you can make it happen as a user is there is a bunch of organizations in native image that you can leverage yourself if you want to get that best big performance. And one very important of them is called profile guide optimizations. And that is an optimization that allows you to build an instrumented version of your application, and then you run it and you apply a relevant workload to it, and it will collect profiles for you. So the same, the same thing the JVM does at runtime, where it looks at your application and what is happening, which methods are being called, which loops are more hot, et cetera, so collects profiles of your app. The same thing we can do with native image, collect those profiles and then feed them into native image to build this optimized version of this app. And that's very cool because you're still building your application ahead of time under closed role assumption, but you get an insight into what will be happening at runtime and which parts of application will be more often. So it makes sense to invest compilation efforts in those specific parts of your app. And I think it's very cool how you kind of bridge this distance between build time and runtime and make sure that we leverage the best of both worlds. So we have awareness of runtime, but we still have, have the power and like of ahead of time optimizations because ahead of time we can dedicate more time and more resources to build a really optimized version of your app. So that is one very important, probably the most important performance optimization. And then we have, in terms of GC, you can use Java and GC to get better performance. And it's also very cool because for some users collecting this profile information and then rebuilding with it might be a bit more, I don't know, complicated or not every user is open to building an instrumented binary and then recompiling again with the profiles. So for those who are looking for like an easier way to build a native executable that still has a very good big performance. It seems like seeing, like predicting profiles for an app seems like this might be a good task for machine learning. 
and it is, and actually where you're doing ML stuff uh, in GraalVM as well. So if you are not doing what we call the user-provided profile guide optimization, so if you're not collecting profiles yourself, we will use ML and the ML model that we have in GraalVM to look at your app and try to predict what the profile will be like, and then we will apply optimizations based on that. And that will not be as precise as collecting actual profiles yourself manually, but this will still give you maybe six, eight percent performance improvement of a baseline native image. And then uh, the very last kind of like smaller but still good performance optimizations is that we have the, this new flag called MRC native. And that is if I know that I'm building my app on the machine where I actually will be running, I can pass this flag and this will look at my machine and the specific hardware config that I have. And it will leverage that specific config to make the most sense out of my machine and my hardware. So we know this, that the Java developers, we care and love our peak performance. And it's a very big, ambitious goal that we make it happen for an IT image that it's as fast as the JVM. Um, when we were talking about basically the heavy lifting that is done by the JVM at runtime, we are actually doing it now on the build time. So I want to understand how does it impact the build time? If there are some numbers that I'm sure it depends again on what kind of application and what exactly do you do in, in the build time. But there are two things, right? Like the build time will increase and also it will take or require more resources. So what are the considerations for developers around that? Yeah, we understand that this is maybe not a limitation, but thing to consider, right? Because no one has patience to wait that long. And it's not always that we have a very good machine, but things are getting better in those both areas. So for build time, we are working on a big ambitious project that maybe we can talk more about in the end because it's like a forward-looking big project but we are preparing some pretty revolutionary stuff in that area but also just over the time the build times got better so i'm doing this all the time at conferences etc i would say it to me personal on my machine which is not even like the most powerful machine in the world but let's say if i need to recompile a spring boot app on this stage i'm very comfortable doing that because again but my string apps that i'm showing can easily recompile in say 40 seconds, maybe 50 seconds, and that the time span that at least like I have for the app. So that's okay for me. Now, in terms of resources usage, uh, I'm glad that you asked because I also just paid attention at the conference where I was recently rebuilding the app on the stage. And as it was building, it also show you, shows you for each step, there are like eight steps to the build process. And for each step, it shows you the amount of time spent in that particular step and the amount of memory spent in that step. And for those steps, again, on my machine, in my case, et cetera, it was usually like under two gigs of memory. So if you have two gigs of memory available in your machine, maybe not the biggest app, but some baseline app, you can totally compile with two gigs. And I think that's right, pretty cool because it's pretty, it's a lot of work that native image does, right? So it needs to look at your entire app the JVM, the, the JDK, the dependencies that it will be using and build what we call a universe. So understand exactly what is happening there and what depends on what and make the sense of your entire image. And it can be, I don't know, like a lot of objects, methods, types, et cetera, that it's looking at. So it's not surprising that it does need some time and resources because what it does is pretty insane. But yeah, I would say that even in such if you have such constraint that let's say maybe you have two gigs of memory available, even then you can build your app. And again, I'm personally a big fan of GitHub Actions. And I think especially in recent years, they got very good runners. So there you can build even larger apps, let's say Screen Pet Clinic, without any problem at all. And a lot of our own demos, a lot of our own stuff is running on GitHub Actions. And those runners that are available there, even like standard GitHub uh, runners, are totally fine in terms of native compilation. So I think that problem of not having enough resources for native compilation, that should not be the case. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And ultimately it's about trade-off and you have to optimize on what is more important for you, right? And sure. if resource usage at the runtime is far more important, startup time is more important than the build times, probably that's the way to go. Um, but these are really important considerations to at least keep in mind uh, when you're making such a move or at least to understand uh, the, the trade-offs here. Uh, this makes sense. And this brings me to the next question, which is about, let's say I'm not a Java developer, but I am, let's say, JavaScript developer. 
or some other language developer. Uh, first of all, I want to understand what is the need for, let's say, a JavaScript developer to use something like RAL VM. And then if at all it is required, what is the change that I'll have to do in my development? Yep. So indeed, there are more languages that you can learn run on raw VM. There is JavaScript, there is Python, there is Ruby. And you can run plain, again, JavaScript, Python, Ruby code, et cetera, on raw VM. And there are some benefits to it. But where we see the most excitement in the community is for embedding those languages in Java programs or doing some other kind of polyglot programming. Because you can definitely run either of those languages, just let's say vanilla Python on raw VM. But where we see the most excitement in the community is mixing up those languages. And we saw some projects in the community where they would use like a bunch of languages in one app. But I would say realistically, where we see a lot of excitement and what I personally like, I see a lot of excitement and things that I would like to do is embedding those languages in Java applications. And that's very cool because there could be different reasons to embed, let's say, JavaScript in Java. So maybe you want to execute some JavaScript and you can do that on the same JVM that your Graal VM runs. Or maybe you want to open your platform, let's say, to other developers or users and you want to be able to execute those scripts, plugins, etc., written in JavaScript on your platform. So Graal VM gives you a chance to do that. And they also have this very cool feature called Polyglot Sandboxing, where, again, you can execute those script, well, let's say, script programs on the JVM, but also you have more control over those scripts. And we have different, like, sandboxing modes and different levels of trust that you can grant that execution. Let's say maybe it's an app in JavaScript that is written by your own team, so you trust it. Or maybe if it's like some third-party dependency or user-provided code, maybe you don't want to trust it for security reasons. And then you can define that as untrusted and a lot of like potentially malicious operations that code could have been executing that will not be allowed. And I think it's pretty cool how you can set those kind of levels of trust and levels of freedom that that code can execute. But even some not necessarily security stuff, but let's say you want to do some server-side rendering on your JVM, so that's where we saw one time a lot of excitement about GraalVM. And then talking about other languages such as Python, it's definitely very useful in the Java community because Java community, it's huge. And I feel like we have a library for every single thing. But also, I think we all can see and appreciate how much of the Python libraries lately are getting traction, especially in things like data science and machine learning. And the idea that we have, it would be great to maybe open that up to the Java community more easily. And then you can have your Java applications and you can do some cool data science ML stuff in your Java app. I would say this like embedding in Java apps, it's where we see most of the community excitement around Polyglot. And I think it totally makes sense. Yeah, that's very cool. I never thought about it. Probably I should dig more into that. Uh, look at that, but also one interesting, like a very niche topic, but also where we see excitement about Graal VM and specifically this like Polyglot and Truffle layer where you can implement languages is that you can also implement your own language on Graal VM. So maybe you always wanted to have your own language implementation, or maybe we saw in some teams that they have their own little languages written for some particular purposes. So you can implement those on Graal VM because the Truffle framework gives you a way to write an interpreter for your language in Java, and then Graal VM will take care of the optimizing performance, giving you the platform, giving you the tooling, etc. And it got to the point where we saw even like students implementing languages on Graal VM just for fun. Obviously, those are not like production grade implementations, but to give an idea of a timeline. So we saw, I think, a PHP implementation on Graal VM implemented by a student just in his free time, basically. And that took him six months to implement on Graal VM. So that is pretty cool. And also one area where we see excitement around Graal VM. Yeah, pretty cool, definitely. Let's talk about the current limitations, and this will have a good segue to talk about the future. What is coming up? What are the future trends? So what are the current limitations that the team is trying to solve? And what are the future trends? And what are the you know, future features that are going to come up in GraalVM? So limitations, I would say GraalVM as a JDK, there are pretty much are no limitations at all, because again, it's JDK, and we're only replacing the compiler. So their migration is super easy and smooth. 
Now, when it comes to native image, we saw a lot of progress lately in the Java community and ecosystem and a lot of excitement around GraalVM. So we see more and more libraries and frameworks becoming compatible with native image every day. And it got to the point where we see libraries being developed like native image friendly from scratch. So all that got easier. And I think even in a year or two from now, it will be even more easy. But yeah, that is one thing to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is performance optimizations. So we are working on a, making applications run with native image as fast as the JVM, but that's an ambitious goal. So I cannot promise you that every single app would necessarily be, fa be faster on native image than on the JVM. We are getting there, but still you need to do your own measurements and see. So that is that. And another really a limitation, but just something that we are working on constantly is developer experience. And we mentioned this briefly, but this is something we are working on a lot. So we are trying to reduce build times. We are trying to reduce memory usage. We got very good at it, I think. And specifically to make it even better, we are now working on this very cool new project and that will be called Layered Native Images. And the way we see this is that we want to give you an opportunity to build a base image. So let's say I'm using Spring Boot, so I can build my JDK base layer, I can build my screen base layer. And then when I need to recompile my application, I only compile, recompile my user code, the one that I wrote. And that's then those base images, I just have them basically as dependencies and don't need to recompile them. So every time I'm introducing a change, I'm only recompiling my user code. And usually that's a fairly thin layer on top of your dependencies. And we expect that this will give us compilation times as uh, low as maybe a couple of seconds or even a second, because everything else is pre-compiled and you're only recompiling your user code. Now, this will be development mode. And this way we will, I think this will be a major developer experience improvement. Even now, I would say developer like build times are good, but if we can put them down to like normal Java compilation times, that will be even better. And that's one benefit that it will give. So faster build times, but also even in terms of deployment, the way we see this, it can be possible to deploy, let's say I want to have five instances of my Spring Boot app. So somewhere in the cloud or wherever I'm deploying my app, I already have those JDK base images, I have my screen base images, and then my five instances can just reuse those underlying best images and we can benefit from resources sharing because like, all of them don't need to have their own base layers anymore. They can just reuse existing ones. So this is a very big, ambitious project. It will take a while to make it happen because it's a totally new way of building native image applications. But I'm very excited about this. And every time I talk to people about it, they are also very excited. So we are working on that. And then when we have another ambitious project that is called GraalOS. So an operating system based on native image, not exactly an operating system, but the name is GraalOS. So we want to give you a platform where you can deploy applications as native images. So not as containers, but as native images. So we want to remove that overhead and complexity of containers entirely. And you just give us your native image and it will give you the platform and things like scaling, security, et cetera, we will take care for you. So your unit of deployment becomes native image and it's simpler as developer experience, but also it removes that even a little but the overhead that containers are creating. So those are two big kind of flagship projects that we are working on. And those will be the next two big things for all VM. Awesome. Yeah, definitely looking forward to all these amazing features. Me too. Um, I, I always like when I look at a technology, I always ask myself, of course, what is the use case where this technology will fit the best? But I also ask, what is the technology or what is the use case that this is not made for? So what is that use case when you would say that, oh, don't look at GraalVM because it's not made for that use case. So is there a use case like that? I get this question at conferences a lot. So like, when should I not use GraalVM? And my answer is always, always use GraalVM. And people are laughing, but like the answer is GraalVM has roughly, let's say, three components, compiler slash JDK, native image, and polyglot. And you can always use one part of it. The question is which one, right? Each of them has its own benefits and trade-offs. Compiler or JDK, that's the best performance, the most smooth transition. 
and then native image, that is startup, resources usage, right, peak performance, package and security, et cetera, and polyglot, that's easy extensibility with other languages, right? So my answer is like, always use Graal VM. There, as a Java developer, there should not be any reason for you not to use Graal VM. Just choose the right component, choose the right part of it. Awesome. What is your suggestion for Java developers who are tired of hearing that, oh, Java is dead and Java is slow and all those kind of comments, and they want to move to a different language? Is there still hope with Kral VM? Or... <laughs> Please don't move to other languages. I have nothing against other languages. We love them. All languages are amazing. But please don't move to other languages. If you have any concerns about Java, I don't think that should be the case anymore in Paint 24. Yeah. In fact, you like brought me very nice to my like point that I also wanted to make. So there was recently a Java 22 release. And on the same day, we also released 12 VM for JDK 22. And if you want to see how amazing Java is now in Paint 24, there is a very nice uh, demo from my colleague, Nikolai Parlog. It's called Modern Java in Action, I think, on GitHub. You can find his demo on GitHub. And it shows all the cool latest Java features. So records, virtual threads, a modern HTTP server, et cetera. It's very cool. And uh, I also have a version, a fork of it in uh, my own GitHub page and my own repo where I took the exact same app and compiled it to native, and now it's also self-contained and very fast, et cetera. So if you want to see where Java is in Python 24, there might be many places, but I recommend checking out those three posts on GitHub, and I hope that you will get as excited about Java as we are. Absolutely. Awesome. So one last question about if developers or a developer wants to start looking at GraalVM. What are the resources or what, what are some steps that you would recommend to get started with Graal VM and build good understanding of how to build applications with Graal VM and more importantly, how to migrate applications to Graal VM and also maintain them in production? So what are some resources or some steps that you would recommend? Yeah, that's a very good question. So for one place to go to for all things GraalVM is our website, that's GraalVM.org. I'm glad that you mentioned migration. We also have guides and reference manuals, so all those things should be fairly easy for you. Now, for installing GraalVM, I would you can just download from us, or even better, you can use SDK Man. If you're not using SDK Man, you should. That's the easiest way to get new SDKs and manage your SDKs. That's one more place. And then if you just want to follow tutorials, you can get maybe like hands-on faster. We have a bunch of demos on GitHub that you can just clone and run yourself locally. And then for community support, we have all kinds of social media. But one more place that I want to recommend is we have a community Slack that is huge. It's like thousands of people. And our team is also there. So if you run into any issue or you just want to ask a question or you just want to talk to other people in the GraalVM community, you can just join our Slack and all that you can do there. Awesome. So yeah, Alina, thanks a lot for joining me today. It was a great discussion. I am more curious now to build applications with GraalVM and I'm, I'm looking forward to all the amazing features that you mentioned your team is working on. And also looking forward to release this episode soon. So thanks a lot for joining me. I hope you also had a great time. Thank you so much for inviting me. I thank you for preparing so well for this episode, for writing the agenda and like being so hands-on with Graal VM. I really appreciate it. Thank you.